Hey everyone, thanks for your time as always, including new viewers to the channel. Last week's roundup went out just ahead of the latest Starship flight test, and SpaceX pulled off that test a week ago. It's only been a week, but now is the time to look for indications about what that means for the mysterious Artemis 3 schedule. The Artemis 2 schedule is still a mystery too, and I'll go over what a new GAO report says about that. I'll also look into plans that the European Space Agency updated for the gateway refueling module they are building for Artemis 5. They increased the capacity of the lunar view to take more advantage of their ride on the SLS upgrade that NASA is building. There were a few other news and notes, so let's dig into all those details. It was an eventful week, but one of the biggest events was at the very beginning of the week with the launch of Starship Flight Test 5 at local daybreak on Sunday, October 13th. The flight achieved the primary objectives that SpaceX stated the week before the flight, with the first recovery of the Super Heavy first stage, catching it above the launch pad, and another successful re-entry of the Starship. This time the ship was able to achieve the objective of landing on target on the surface of the ocean. The success of the flight test reinforces the idea that it's only a question for Starship of when rather than if, but the question of when remains unclear. Now that the flight is complete, hopefully there will be more transparency in the coming weeks from SpaceX or NASA about the forward outlook for 2025 and a roadmap of milestones from where they are right now. It's been a long time since the schedule was refreshed and the roadmap is still unclear. Starship is getting closer to its first orbital flight test, but it's hard to see the path from there to the on-orbit tech demos that NASA needs for Artemis 3 the propellant transfer demo, the uncrewed lunar landing demo, and the crewed landing demo that is a part of the Artemis 3 mission itself. For now, in terms of the watch items for Artemis 3, we'll have to see where that orbital flight test occurs. At this year's International Astronautical Congress in Milan, Italy, the European Space Agency and Talos Alenia Space announced that they have formalized an upgrade of the Lunar View Gateway module. Originally a part of the European System Providing Refueling, Infrastructure, and Telecommunications element, or ESPRI, the refueling capabilities were divided out after the post-Artemis makeover of the Gateway in 2019 and 2020, where the Human Landing System program became a higher priority. The communications capabilities were added to the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO module, which was redesigned to launch connected to the Power and Propulsion element. In earlier gateway concepts, the PPE was going to launch first, then Esprit and a utilization module would be brought up on SLS Block 1B with Orion. Post Artemis, it became the Esprit Refueling Module, or ERM. The module provides the aforementioned refueling capabilities for the PPE propulsion systems, the xenon for the solar electric propulsion engines, and the bipropellant for the more conventional hypergolic thrusters. It also has a pressurized area and an area with windows around the circumference, somewhat like the International Space Station's cupola. That pressurized area also provides a volume for internal logistics to be loaded for launch. ESA and NASA have been planning the upgrade for a while, which increases the size of the recently renamed Lunar View module. According to the ESA news release from October 14th, previously the ERM was 3.4 meters wide, 3 meters long, with a launch mass of 6 metric tons. That was expanded to 4.6 meters wide, 6.4 meters long, with a launch mass of 10 metric tons. The expansion allows as much as 1.5 extra tons of launch logistics, installation of two grapple fixtures on the module for the Canadian Space Agency's Canada Arm 3, and bringing the spacecraft's avionics inside the pressurized volume, which will make maintenance easier. Hopefully no spacewalks needed. The post-Artemis changes to the Gateway's timeline included postponing the first element launch until after Artemis 3, but related to this, the Trump administration wanted to cancel the SLS upgrades beginning with the exploration upper stage. Original concepts for Gateway modules like Lunar View used the original EUS capability, but with that being threatened with cancellation, preliminary designs fit in the more common 5-meter diameter fairings of commercial launch vehicles like Ariane, Falcon, Vulcan, and so on. This is a notional graphic provided by ESA Communications, which shows that evolution of the module from its ERM origins to the notional design for Lunar View today. 
After the Biden administration took over, the EUS cancellation threats were dropped. While it was put on the back burner in case of cancellation, EUS had gone through a redesign in 2019 to optimize performance of the SLS Block 1B vehicle for co-manifested payloads with Orion. LunarView's design was upgraded to take more advantage of the larger volume in the universal stage adapter that sits on top of the 8.4 meter wide EUS. And those changes are being formalized now. This graphic also notes some of the elements of the module in the second view, which was one of the intermediate steps. At the top is the Passive International Berthing and Docking Mechanism, or IBDM. That will become the docking target for visiting vehicles after Lunar View is added to the gateway. Then below that are where the batteries and power control distribution unit avionics used to be on the unpressurized exterior. Below that are the windows and tunnel section, then the unpressurized module and xenon transfer section. Below that, the launcher interface is where the module will be secured to the SLS payload attach fitting, and the active IBDM is the other axial docking port that will connect Lunar View to a radial docking port on Halo. Both of these docking mechanisms, along with the one on the Halo, support the fluid quick disconnects that allow both xenon and hypergolic bipropellants to be transferred from Lunar View through Halo to PPE and also from visiting vehicles to Lunar View. The evolution to the right of that retains all those elements. According to ESA via the Gateway program back in May, welding of the Lunar View structure was targeted for no earlier than the fourth quarter of 2025. But the news release states that the design is still in a preliminary phase. Detailed design will follow. The module is not scheduled for launch until Artemis 5, which is currently manifested as no earlier than 2030. The Government Accounting Office published Report GAO 25-106943, reporting to Congress on the Exploration Ground Systems Program. The report focused on the near-term Artemis missions, Artemis 2, 3, and 4, where EGS is operating, modifying, or upgrading ground hardware and software. Or, in the case of Mobile Launcher 2, developing and assembling new ground hardware and software. In terms of findings, GAO found that for Artemis 2, there was no schedule margin left for the current public target date, which is next September. In some cases, status was audited through June, and given the schedule even back at that time, GAO found that the September 2025 date was likely to be delayed. Also given that it's likely there will be issues during the launch campaign that caused the schedules to slip a few days here, a week or two there. We saw that during the Artemis 1 launch campaign, and there's a lot of new equipment and an astronaut crew this time. The schedules cited in the report have changed since then, and more importantly, as I've repeated ad nauseum, NASA still needs to announce a decision on what they are going to do with the Orion base heat shield on the Artemis 2 spacecraft. Orion remains the critical path for the Artemis 2 schedule, and I'll come back to Orion and the schedule in a little bit. The report also notes that there's not much default schedule margin between Artemis 2 and 3. The report notes that, quote, NASA plans for one year between the Artemis 2 and 3 launches, which officials said is a very tight turnaround, unquote. Even though EGS is only planning to refurbish Mobile Launcher 1 after the Artemis 2 launch, the report notes that there could be lessons learned for the hardware and the ground launch control software that might require some additional work before Artemis 3. EGS performed a lot of work to harden the mobile launcher and systems in response to the data recorded and damage seen after the Artemis 1 launch. A lot of that was detailed in the OIG report released in May. This GAO report notes that EGS is bookkeeping a month for standard refurbishment after Artemis 2, but is also bookkeeping up to four months in case the damage from the launch is more severe. An extra three months of work could be a threat to the goal of a 12-month turnaround. For Artemis 4, NASA contracted with Bechtel to construct Mobile Launcher 2. The audit for this report was conducted from July 2023 to October 2024. The audit for a separate OIG report on Mobile Launcher 2 concurrently overlapped that from September 2023 to July 2024. So a lot of the findings in this report were recently detailed in that OIG report published at the end of August. 
A couple of those observations were that the joint confidence level schedule assessment for completion of ML2 isn't compatible with the current Artemis IV launch date. There isn't enough time in between. After a long, rocky start to the project, NASA is now reporting improvements in Bechtel's schedule performance. A couple of other items from the report are worth noting. The first was to underscore that the platforms in VAB High Bay 3 need to be changed between Artemis 3 and 4 when the mobile launcher switch occurs between Mobile Launcher 1 and ML2, which is to support the upgraded SLS Block 1B vehicle with Exploration Upper Stage. Some platforms will be replaced and some will be relocated. The report notes that platform reconfig has to occur before Mobile Launcher 2 can go through a series of verification and validation tests in the VAB. And that will be one of the items that needs to be synchronized between the Artemis 3, VAB, and ML2 delivery schedules. And then for Artemis 2, the report notes that the environmental control system in VAB High Bay 3 was overhauled after Artemis 1. ML1 was rolled back from Launchpad 39B to High Bay 3 a couple of weeks ago, but this is the first time it has been inside for a couple of years. After completing rounds of integrated systems verification and validation tests at the pad, another round of VNV needs to be completed between ML1 and the VAB ECS. The report makes the important point that the VNV testing needs to be completed before SLS is powered up in High Bay 3. So in other words, after the boosters are stacked and the core stages mated to them, that would be the earliest opportunity to power up the SLS flight computers and avionics, after all the power and data lines between the boosters and core were connected. The GAO report notes that EGS could do all that booster segment stacking and core stage to booster mate in parallel with the ECS verification and validation work. That segues into news and notes, beginning with the Artemis II big picture. After the GAO report was published on Thursday, October 17th, Eric Berger published a story about it, which included a useful note of clarification from NASA. The space agency is quoted via public affairs as saying, quote, the Artemis I heat shield investigation process is still underway, so NASA has not made any decisions yet, unquote. The emphasis in that quote for me is NASA stating that they have not made any decisions, but there are multiple choices they have to make. With respect to the most prominent decision for Artemis II, then we can assume not only that there's no announcement yet, but that there's been no decision yet. That choice would start with the decision whether to fly the base heat shield as is or replace it. But then there's the decision about whether or not to keep the Artemis II crew on the mission. NASA has not said whether they are considering that or not, in which case maybe they ruled that out earlier. But then there are decisions to be made about the other heat shield that is already built, the one that was built for the Artemis III Orion. That's a decision that might be related to what to do with the Artemis II base heat shield, but maybe not. For example, NASA could choose to fly both the Artemis II and III units as is, but could also make separate decisions for each. That's the more likely scenario that I've heard, which is that the Artemis III Orion needs a new production unit either finish the next unit in assembly, or tear down the current Artemis III unit and rebuild it with modifications based on the root cause investigation. It's also not clear if the time frame for those decisions are the same either. If I take that line in Eric's story literally, NASA is suggesting that production work on Orion heat shields is on hold, which would have implications not only for Artemis III and IV, but possibly also for Artemis II in the case where Artemis II needs a new production unit. If heat shield production is frozen, that means availability of the next heat shield unit is delayed that much longer, until NASA makes those decisions. So, uh, yeah, I asked NASA Public Affairs to clarify a pretty unequivocal statement, because everything is complicated. They said they're working on a response, but that won't be available until next week at the earliest. Coming back to the rest of the Artemis II big picture, I checked with Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs about the status of the second round of Orion vacuum testing. As I reported previously, NASA Exploration Directorate leadership said in late August that Orion needed to go back into the altitude chamber in the operations and checkout building at KSC, at the time saying that would be in a couple of months. 
Now that Hurricane Milton made a mess across Florida a week ago and shut down pretty much all launch activity on the Space Coast for about a week, I asked for an update on that. Via PAO, Orion and prime contractor Lockheed Martin stated that they were working to move the spacecraft back into the chamber in November for that second round of vacuum testing. So that is a further drift of the schedule to the right. If vacuum testing isn't completed until sometime in November, and final installations and closeouts were expected to take a couple of months or thereabouts, that would put EGS handover out in the January time frame. The GAO report was noting thin schedule margins for some of the EGS work, and this would also put Orion in that category too. Even if NASA decides to fly Artemis II as is with the installed base heat shield, those are factors that suggest that the September 2025 target is eventually going to be pushed towards the end of the year. Elsewhere at KSC, the Core Stage 4 engine section was finally moved from the VAB to its production site, in the Space Systems Processing Facility on Tuesday, October 15th. KSC Public Affairs posted a few pictures of that move out of the VAB transfer aisle, down State Road 3, and into the SSPF airlock. The transfer probably means that Boeing has completed reconfiguring its workspace inside the SSPF. The boat tail for the Core Stage 3 engine section was recently mated, and that unit has moved from one footprint to another. That is now in footprint 5 to complete integration and be ready for final assembly with the rest of that stage. Now that footprint 7 is vacated, presumably the core stage 4 engine section can move into that to resume its integration work. I asked PAO if we could get some pictures of that, and we'll see what we get down the road. NASA Stena Space Center Public Affairs posted some shots of exploration upper stage green run preparations there in the B2 test stand position. The inner stage simulator was lifted into the stand again, this time for installation. Previously, it was for preliminary fit checks, but that was the balance of the post. It's not on nearly the same scale as Starship development, but like IFT-5, the progress here on the test stand for the EUS Green Run is coupled with very little information about the forward outlook or roadmap to this test. In this case, test stand readiness is obviously getting closer, but how much closer is a mystery. And unfortunately, that's emblematic of the current Artemis situation as a whole. From Starship to SLS, the mystery about the next two years and beyond that is deepening even as we see obvious evidence of progress. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.